Good evening, Honourable Karu Jaya Surya, Speaker of the Democratic Republic of Sri Lanka, Professor Lashman Watawala, President CMA, Professor Mervyn King, uh, Chair Emeritus of IIRC. It's my tremendous pleasure, a pleasure tonight actually to be able to address all of you on this topic called accountability, meritocracy and anti-corruption. I like to call them keys, three keys to achieve sustainable development. What I'm going to do tonight, uh, rather than taking a much more formal approach, I'm going to share with you these three key aspects from a storytelling perspective. A story of a young man growing up in a country called Singapore, as it is. What I'm going to cover is talk about an unusual development. I'm going to briefly mention about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2030 to ensure that we have an eyeball what are those 17 goals. I, I will talk about the three key factors to sustainable development as highlighted. And I would like to suggest seven possible causes of sustainable development growing up in the country that I've seen moving from a very uh, developing country into what it is today. I will give you some further uh, food for thoughts in sustainable development and I'll close the night with two caution that's happening around us in this world. The question I ask here is how did we get from 1960s to 2019? What are some of the key factors? Believe it or not, I grew up in the picture that is, this is a village in Singapore in the 1960s. I was born in the 60s. And at one point in time, I, li I live under coconut trees in a village with adept houses. My parents have five sons, and I'm number four as it is. We are probably part of the first generation of Singaporeans that live in public housing. Uh, there were five of us uh, as children, together with my parents. We live in a two-bedroom apartment, the first generation of public housing in Singapore. And as one of the five kids, together with my four brothers, we always only sleep on mattress and I slept on it for the next 18 years of my life. And the only time I ever had a proper bed was when I was enlisted to the Singapore Armed Force as an enlistee, as a recruit as it is. So this is what Singapore was in the 60s. And within that generation, about 50 years, we have developed into a metropolis. Uh, this is what we see. And in fact, that particular water pool that you see there is a man-made lake. It's a water catchment in which as a country, because we have no natural resources, no natural water, we try to capture 90% of all the rainfall in Singapore and make them into drinkable water. What do we need to do to have a sustainable development? This is a park in Singapore called the Bishan Park. And behind those are all what we so-call the modern-day public housing. And believe it or not, this entire place that you've seen here was once upon a time a graveyard. That was one of the largest Chinese cemeteries that Singapore had. And in the last 20 years, we decided to, as we developed, to exhume the graves and to transform the entire place into a park and into public housing. And the question we have to ask is, how, what do we need to do to have a sustainable development? As we develop as a nation, we do not have the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations. But I think those 17 goals gives us a good reflection of what we want the society to be. Starting with goal number one, there is no poverty as it is. Number two, zero hunger. Number three, good health and well-being. Number four, quality education. Number five, gender equality. Number six, clean water and sanitation. Number seven, we have affordable and clean energy. Number eight, decent work and economic growth. Number nine, industry, innovation and infrastructure. Number 10, reduce inequalities. Number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Number 12, we have responsible consumption and production. Number 13, climate action. 14, life below water. Number 15, life on land. 16, peace 
justice and strong institutions and 17 partnerships for the goals. We can basically take these goals as nothing more than a laundry list. Alternatively, we may have to turn our antenna and say, maybe this is what we need to define the economy, the community that we need to live in. Maybe these are the ideals and these are the sustainable goals where we need to have a concerted push to make us as a community, as a country and as a people to move towards. This is another view of the Singapore that we have. We have decided to build an entire garden in the city. This is the Marina Bay Sand. We have decided basically to ensure that in our development, that we will not forget the fact that we still need the nature. We put the flowers, the plant, back into the country where we level the land to build housing, to develop the place as it is. Three key factors in contributing to sustainable development, and I would like to share with you what are these three key factors. First, accountability. The need for an existence of check and balance. And I think we are all very we all understand the challenge. Power corrupts. Absolute power will corrupt absolutely. And in order to have a sustainable development, we can never allow any a single party, single individual, or single decision maker to have the absolute power. There must be a creation of check and balance as it is to ensure that that power is fully accountable for. And how can we make that accountable? We make it transparent, such that the individuals can audit the books, such that there is nothing to hide whatsoever, such that if we apply our mind, we will be able to know the truth. So this is one of the major mechanisms that was created since the founding of our country as it is. We have a very powerful Auditor's General Office, where the basic responsibility was to check the government to ensure that there is no corruption as it is. And every year, the AGO, the Auditor's General Office, publish the fearsome, they call that blue book, in which they will itemize what were the wastage or what were the possible corruptions that were found within those statutory boards or ministry in which the Auditor's General would have audited for that particular year. Accountability ensure the certainty of the application of rules of law. That means no one is above the law. No one is above the law. That means primarily we ensure that everyone is accountable for their action. And this is what accountability as a first key factor. A second key factor is meritocracy. I would like to suggest meritocracy will suggest the best person for the job. There must be a clear benchmark for choice of best candidates. Singapore is not unlike uh, Sri Lanka. We came from a country in which there were multi-religion, multi-racial, multi-beliefs, and society with different classes, the rich and the poor. And one of the most damaging things that will kill us as a nation or destroy sustainable development is when we start to become biased, in which decisions are made not based on meritocracy, but based on the colour of one's skin, based on who we are related to, based on what is my religion, and based on the network that I come from. I'm very thankful for the fact that as I grew up in a country like Singapore, meritocracy was one opportunity that allows me to grow and prosper. I came from a very poor family, but within a poor family, it doesn't matter that as long as I'm good in my studies, it opens a path for me to be trained to be trained to be an accountant as it is. My parents never finished their primary school education, but it doesn't prevent their children or his, their son become a professor of accounting one day. This is what meritocracy is all about. It must be blind to race, religion, social, economically. In other words, we must allow the best to surface to the top based purely on what he can offer to the society at large. A third dimension and key is anti-corruption. I'd like to suggest that there must be a reduction of unfair advantage. There is 
corruption by definition will eat into the trust of the system as it is because people no longer believe that justice will be done because the judges, the decision makers can be bribed and definitely under those circumstances in an anti-corrupt environment we will always have the certainty of the best outcome we live in this ideal world right? I have seen it with my own eyes the transformation of a village country into a metropolis today and these are some of the principles that we held very dearly as a nation building let me look at an impact analysis if we have these three factors on our left the accountability meritocracy and anti-corruption what are the short-term impact and effect if these are missing from our society if a society has no accountability, where meritocracy is replaced by uh, nepotism and corruption is the way of life, in the short term, there will be significant amount of wastage of resources due to game playing because the people realise they, they don't have to work hard. They just need to cozy up to the right person, join the right network, have the right friends or pay the right price and things will be done and it will create a society where every man is for themselves because of this short-termism, what can I get best out of the system? Rather than working hard and playing their part to reap the benefits of hard work. There will be extreme risk-taking because then life becomes a game of chance. I have only one chance, depending on who I talk to, who I become a friend to. Or what do I stumble upon in terms of giving the right price or the right bribe? There will be tremendous misgiving and hostilities and all these will spill into the long term. In fact, the long term we will have will be a breakdown of trust in the system, the society and the community. The community can never get rid of social, racial and religious tension so long as we do not have accountability meritocracy and anti-corruption because certain segments of the society will be favoured. And that favouring of the certain segment of society will by definition incur the wrath of those who are not in the favourable boats. And that society will break down. There will be depletions of talents, hard work and excellence because the young people will realise, why do I want to work so hard? Why do I want to study so hard at the universities or work so hard in my high school? Because the selection of university places is dependent upon who the person is related to. I'm not selected for the job. I'm not selected for the entry to universities because of my hard work, because of my achievements. It's based on network. And the young people and the people will lose faith in the system and they will not put their efforts and time to train hard to be a professional. A Harvard study says or suggests to, to be an expert in a certain field, you need to spend 10,000 hours doing that job and doing it well. If after spending 10,000 hours in doing that job and doing it well, my neighbour who did not, but because of his network, he gets the job, what is the incentive for me then to be trained to be a professional? These are the long-term consequences. And the long-term consequence is also you will have an unstable society. A society that teeters almost as a time bomb where there will be civil unrest because certain pockets will rise up to articulate or to air their unfairness. Poverty and underdevelopment will be a, natu nat uh, a natural part of this society. And finally, the income distribution will widen because the rich will continue to be much richer while the poor will descend downward in the spiral downwards as it is. This is what accountability, meritocracy and anti-corruption will do to a nation if we are not careful. And this is what I think we must pay attention to if we want a sustainable community, a sustainable development. Allow me to, in the next few slides, to share with you some seven possible contributions to sustainable development. I have the tremendous privilege of uh, growing up in Singapore. I spent a large number of years in Australia, a large number of years in America. I returned back to Singapore in the last 20 years. 
having the opportunity to reflect upon how did we have such a good fortune as a developing country. I've shared this before in an audience about five, six years ago. Number one, I think it's very important to have a stable and efficient government. The government leads the way. The government must give us the best of our leadership because there are things that the community and individual cannot do except a good government, a centralised government. There must be advancement and promotion based on meritocracy, as it is. When we hire someone for the job, we do not ask who are their parents. We do not ask uh, what is your race, what is your religion, as it is. We look at the candidate, we talk to the candidate, and we give the job to the candidate which we deem as most qualified for the job. It has to be a market-driven economy to a certain extent. That means we must let basically the people flourish. That means the individuals that put in the hard work ought to be rewarded. The laborers who are rewarded for the fruit of the laborers will be the laborers who will work hard because they know that they are much like a shareholders who will get the benefits of their labor. There must be a sense of pursuit of excellence. Right? Excellence must be pursued in all dimensions. I'm an associate professor at universities. My staff is always terrified by my demands of excellence because every paper that they write, every PowerPoint that they create, I want to see the color coordination. I want to see the font size because I believe that if excellence personified us, the works of our hands will always be par excellence. Right? The works of our hands, people will enjoy and like the things that we do. Excellence must become a framework, part and parcel of our life. Of course, some of my staff say that Prof. Ho is suffer from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder as it is. But we must not compromise on what we think is best. I always have students and I always tell my students, if you are a first class honour student, that means you have the talents and the gift and the capability to be a first class honour student, if you get an upper second class honours, in my eyes, you are a failure. You are a failure because you have not exercised your talents to the best of your excellence because that is what you were made and meant to be as it is. And this is something that we need to pursue. I'd like to suggest too, there must be a clear-cut investment in education and infrastructure. For a developing country, it was very clear that education is a social leveller. It doesn't matter what is your background, as long as you're willing to apply your mind, to work hard basically with your studies and the education you have given, you will be able to do well. My parents, although were not educated, they will always use these Chinese proverbs and remind us, within the books lies the golden house. Within the books lies the golden house, as it is. And this is when we were young, we were willing and able to pursue education. I'd like to suggest too, there must be investment to develop infrastructure, roads, buildings. All right. Investing in the university, institution that allows us basically to develop the nation. There is a significant difference between consumption and investment. Consumption are those things that you consume now and they're gone. But investment are things that, and money that you spend, they will have a long-term consequences because they will bear fruits in years to come. And as a nation, as a people, we need to decide what to and where do we want to do the investment. Unfortunately too, we have to adapt to a changing world. The time runs out very fast. Tomorrow I'll be giving a talk on what are the needs of a new profession. And as an associate provost in Singapore that looks after skills future, one of the greatest nightmares the Singapore government has is that in due time, if we do not adapt to a changing world, the world will leave us behind in terms of skill set, in terms of the types of labor that we have, because the labor will be deemed not skillful enough to deal with a changing world. And the last thing I would like to suggest to you in terms of sustainable development is that we have to work hard on community harmony. We have some success in Singapore, but we are very mindful of the fact that a callous words, a callous video can fracture the racial line that we have tried to live in harmony for many years. A, 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 a sermon 
that criticize another religion can flare up into community unrest. That means we need to constantly guard and maintain this community harmony that can never be taken uh, for granted as it is. Things that is built over the years can be destroyed absolutely and thoroughly by a moment of insanity or a moment of carelessness. Allow me to give you some food for thoughts before I finish off with two cautions. The food for thought is, one, learning from the global best in class practices. We are very privileged in this conference with Professor Mervyn King. Right? We have various experts from different countries to come here. And I think we, we have to take a position that there is so much for us to learn from the rest of the world as it is. And we must not be afraid to basically invite them or to send our best of people basically to the rest of the world to learn from the things that they do. Singapore Institute of Technology, we are building our new campus. Our new campus will be built in 2023. As part of the process in building this new campus, we are housed in a temporary uh, campus as it is. As part of the campus, we the management were sent all over the world to look at what are the technologies that other universities are using. Take an example, we take attendance. With facial recognition technology, we don't have to take attendance anymore because a facial recognition technology will be able to pick up who are the individuals who turn up for class. Right? In fact, that will to a certain extent also reduce the amount of security because we know who enters the campus. But we must be open in our mind to see what is the best in the world as it is. What are the changing landscape? But having said that we need to learn from the global best in class, we always need to remember our local situation is always unique. And there's no necessity to just follow what the best in class in the world does. We need to take those solutions and adapt it and convert it into a local solution with its local uniqueness, something that we are proud of rather than we're just mimicking what the rest of the world is doing. The third point I'd like to suggest, and I always tell my staff and management, management, we are the prophets. Management are prophets. Prophets has two basic uh, uh, functions. One, the prophet tells the truth as it is, as he sees it. Another thing that prophet does is that a prophet tells about the future. Management decision makers are prophet because we are given the responsibility to look down at the corridor of time and to make a prediction concerning what the future world will look like. And having an insight and understanding of what the future world will look like, we must then decide to take actions today to bring us into the future as it is. I was asked to chair a, 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 a working task force called Human Capabilities in the Future Digital Economy and Society in Singapore. The Singapore government forms this task force. Its task is primarily to look at what would Singapore look like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now as a digital society and a digital economy. And there are major differences between these two things, the society and the economy. Society talks about the well-being of the entire community, while the economy talks about economic well-being, the workforce as it is. And as a country, we were concerned that our people will be left behind as the world changes. So they set aside this task force and asked, what are the things that we need to do today? What are the research that we need to do? What are the studies that we need to do to prepare the population that will move into a digital world 10, 20, 30 years from now? And the government has basically said that they will set aside money to do research, to allow us to forecast what the future is. This is our responsibility as decision maker. We are the prophets of today because one of our major responsibility is that we must look down at the corridor of time and ask the question, what would the world look like? And what must I do to bring my people, my company there? And the fourth thing I'd like to suggest to you is investing in opportunities. Some of the opportunities will come and go. And in fact, uh, this is the fifth time I'm judging, uh, serving as a judge in your integrated reporting. I'd like to suggest that I think 
Sri Lanka, you have actually selected a winner because the integrated reporting provides you a framework which allows the companies to ask the critical question, what are the key elements in value creations? And it allows you a framework where you do not need to start all over again. You do not need to try to piece it from anywhere else in the world by using that framework to look at the value creation as it is. That opportunity is given to you and you have invested in that opportunity. And you have basically selected, I think, a winner. And this is where I hope the corporate uh, entities in Sri Lanka will continue to move forward in this opportunity that you have chosen. Let me finish off with two cautions. Very down to earth as it is, the rise in Hong Kong. What went wrong? How did a prosperous city descend into chaos so quickly? We are still analyzing what went wrong. And one possibility that went wrong is that all the cracks and the fractures in the society were there, but the people were not looking and asking the right questions. When the young people feel that they have no hope, when the young people felt that there is no future and prosperity for them, this is what you will get. And this was a major lesson for us in Singapore because we asked the same question. Can Singapore descend into chaos overnight? And the answer is always absolutely yes. Because, and particularly when we are complacent and we fail to look at the signs that are changing or that are affecting our people. But the last caution I have is, and I'll call this, it may take a vote to undo centuries of good works. Four and a half years ago, UK made a decisive referendum. That referendum has plunged the entire country in a chaos four and a half years later on. And there's no end in sight as it is. And come 30th of October, we will see another saga that will continue some more into the future. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've shared with you what is something that is deep within my heart. What I've learned as a young man and the tremendous privilege I have to grow up in a country that has the swamp land, that has the village, that once upon a time I live under coconut trees in a tap house. But I was given the tremendous opportunity and we did something right. But that something can never be taken for granted. And with this, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to share with all of you. Thank you.